Hello, friends. So I'll be giving a bit of an overview on this uh, new concept that seems to be evolving in our ICU. And we are increasingly seeing this entity called EDCA. We can call it as EDCA, Leukemic Diabetic Ketoacidosis. So we are seeing it more commonly in lieu of uh, increased usage of SGLT2 inhibitors and a few other comorbidities and triggers. And it's extremely important to recognize this because this can be very easily masked. So any patient who comes with ketone bodies positive and having diabetes on the background and not necessarily sugars being high, always raise the suspicion of EDCA. And if you do not treat this appropriately with insulin and dextrose, acidosis don't get corrected. So I've, we've had instances where our trainee group have embarked on, in fact, pondering on doing dialysis because acidosis was not getting corrected. And once you start insulin with dextrose, uh, they remarkably get corrected. So this is a very simple, I mean, uh, you need to have a clarity because you don't know what the underlying problem is. Then you would be breaking your head in trying to do all extraordinary things. The simple thing is we have to give insulin and dextrose. That remains a quintessence. So, request, so acknowledge my colleague, uh, Dr. Surya, who helped me develop this content. So it's very similar to DKA. So what, what are the components of diabetic ketoacidosis? So the, the DKA, there is reduced insulin. It could be absolute reduction in insulin and relative reduction with increase in blood sugar. So this increase in blood sugar tends not to be there in euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. And of course, there'll be dehydration and acidosis. So these are the four components of diabetic ketoacidosis. And there is derangement of intermediary metabolites leading to the accumulation of uh, keto acids, which is acetoacetic acid and beta hydroxybutyric acid. So this is the sort of a fulcrum or the uh, or the core of what decay is. And with EDCO also, all these components remain, but the increase in blood sugar not necessarily may be present. That's why we call it as euglycemic. So what does EDCA constitute? EDCA, there is reduced in insulin, which can be absolute and relative. But there is euglycemia. Blood sugar more often will be less than 250. So it could be, some, it can be normal or generally it tends to be less than 250. And that is where the suspicion of uh, euglycemic diabetic ketosis does not arise. They can have dehydration, but they will have acidosis. So bicarbonate has to be less than 18 milliequivalents and ketone bodies will be positive in this. So when you have a patient, where sugars are normal, ketone bodies is positive. Obviously, our differentials run like whether it is starvation, whether it is alcoholic. But nowadays, think of euglycemic diabetes because of the increase in the usage of HGLT2 inhibitors. So here, the, there is a reduced availability of glucose. That's why we have to give glucose with insulin to correct this acidosis. And there is reduced production of glucose. So this is the core aspect of you. That's why there is euglycemia. There is reduced so I'll tell you why there is reduced availability because the use of sodium glucose transporter inhibitor leads to glycosuria because there is excess loss of glucose. That's why the relative blood sugar levels will be less. And there is increase. Like DKA, there is increase in the counter-regulatory hormones and there is increase in the glucose and insulin ratio gets deranged and there is increase in this ratio. So there are three important causes of EDCA which you have to think of. Any diabetics, look into their drug chart, whether they are on SGLT2 inhibitors, because now with AHA guidelines, many of these patients to, with an intent to reduce the cardiovascular risk, so the guidelines do suggest the use of SGLT2 inhibitors, and this is leading to increase in the risk of EDCA. So one of the primordial cause why ERCA is in increasing is the use of SGLT2 inhibitors. Pregnancy is another important cause. And of course, starvation. For any reason, patient is not consuming adequate nutrition for whatever reason due to GI symptoms on and so forth. They are at a risk of ERCA. So these remain the three important causes. So what are the triggers for ERCA? Like in DKA, the triggers of EDCA are very similar. So it could be polytrauma, exercise, it could be all the triggers. So there is a separate video which I've done on DKA and you please go through it and the pathophysiological aspects and the triggers and the differential diagnosis all remain the same. So it can be a stroke, it can be surgery, alcohol, infection, ACS and drugs like glucocorticoids, thiazide, sympathomimetic drugs and someone who have a background of liver disease, pancreatitis, okay. so this is a typical ICU patient. 
they come with either stroll they come with acs they may have underlying ckd they can have underlying liver dysfunction so all these are triggers so it can be any any of these which, uh, which are typically the triggers for dke are also the trigger of euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis so just historically this was first discovered in 1973 by munro from uk where they did a case series so they looked at 211 patients with diabetic ketoacidosis. Basically, all the literature you have on euglycemic at this point of time were to identify this cohort of patients within the spectrum of DKA. So they looked at 211 DKA, of which 37 had EDCA. And this is another case series or a prospective cohort from a UK group. 722 DKA that evaluated and 23 had an EDCA. And they put a prevalence rate of around 3.2%. This was an, another meta-analysis from China where they looked at 156 DKA and they had 4 EDCA with a prevalence of or occurrence rate of 2.6%. So this is the sort of data we have. But now maybe we need to renew our observations as to how the pattern of EDCA is increasing in the diabetic patients with the uh, overzealous usage of our SGLT2 inhibitor with an intent to reduce the cardiovascular risk. I think we need more data now. This is all a historic data, not necessarily maybe applicable to the current surge in the in the euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis we are seeing. So why SGLT2 inhibitors? Just to recapitulate our memory, uh, there is a separate video on SGLT2 inhibitors. So it, as the name sounds, it's the sodium glucose transport inhibitor. And just from physiological standpoint, 90% of the glucose is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. And that is where your SGLT2 acts on the proximal convoluted tubule. As the name sounds, you need SGLT2. If you look at this figuratively, for the reabsorption of uh, sodium and the glucose, you need SGLT2. So basically, this inhibition of SGLT2 uh, leads to failure of reabsorption of sodium and glucose and they get secreted into the tubules and there is excess of glycosuria and there is natriuresis that tends to happen with the use of SGLT2. Because of glycosuria that happens, the relative blood glucose level will be less and and. Of course, there will be ketone production that will happen that leads to EDCA. So if you look from pathophysiological standpoint, someone who is on SGLT2 inhibitors, there is glycosuria, there is natriuresis, and along with this, there is increase in the ketone body reabsorption. This is the pathophysiology of EDCA. And pancreas, there is reduced, uh, as they are diabetic, there is reduced insulin secretion, and there is in increase in the glucagon secretion. And all this reduced insulin secretion leads to increased lipolysis, there is free fatty acids, and this undergoes beta oxidation, leading to increased ketogenesis. So this is the typical pathophysiological pathway that tends to happen in uh, euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. There's increased ketone production, more from the SGLT2 usage, increased lipolysis, increased free fatty acids, which undergo beta oxidation, producing increased ketogenesis. All this leads to increased ketone bodies that leads to euglycemic DK. So just remember this picture. If asked in exam, just put out this picture. So this is the typical conundrum that tends to happen leading to EDCA. So what are the symptoms of EDCA? They're very similar to DKA. So there's nothing different. So they can have increased thirst. They can have vomiting, blurring of vision, confusion, obtundation, fatigue, abdominal pain, polyuria. So these are all quite archaic and germane sort of a features that you would be hearing and fairly intuitive for all our intensive care friends. So it can be very non-specific symptoms. Symptoms generally will be due to the underlying trigger. It could be sepsis or it could be stroke or it could be some worsening AKI on CKD or worsening liver dysfunction or it could manifest post-surgically, post-trauma, so on and so forth. So that possibly tends to superimpose over actual symptoms of TK. This is fairly, I'm sure, common sense for all of us. So, but they can have this extreme fatigability and obtundation, so on and so forth. And they can have tachycardia and they can have hypotension. So all these come a uh, little later in the phase. So when you look at diagnostic criteria for EDCA and compare it with DKA, there's actually not much difference. Uh, the criteria are very similar, except in DKA, blood sugar levels is more than 250, but in EDCA, it is less than 250. But if you look at other parameters, pH is less than 7.3 in both. Bicarbonate should be less than 18 in both. And anion gap is more than 10 in both. And ketone bodies are present in DKA and EDCA and it should be more than or equal to two ketone bodies. So the criteria is very similar to DKA except that your blood sugar level will be less than 250 in EDCA.
So when you look at treatment, it's very similar to DKA. Look into the video that I have done on DKA, the fluid management. It is with fluids. You have to resuscitate, maintaining uvolemia. And all my intensive care friends are experts in good fluid resuscitation. Do good resuscitation based on your dynamic measures of fluid responsiveness. Start with 15 to 20 ml. Most importantly, correction of the underlying serum electrolytes plus insulin. Here, it is the condition where at the outset, because your sugar is less, you have to give insulin with dextrose because there is reduced glucose production. There is glycosuria that has happened and reduced glucose sort of an availability. You have to give dextrose to correct the acidosis, but at the same time prevent hypoglycemia and maintain the sugars at around 150 to 200 by using dextrose and insulin combination. Once your uvolemia is set in, you can wean off your fluid resuscitation. Most importantly, like in DK, you have to treat the underlying cause. And sodium bicarbonate could be considered if pH is less than 7 or bicarbonate less than 5. So this is just a sort of a broad framework of management. I'm sure most of my intensive care friends are experts in managing DK. If you want to dwell into the details of treating DK, there is a separate video. But this is just the overall sort of a pillars of management of EDCA. So the key aspect is give insulin with dextrose where there is a suspicion of EDCA. If you have... Uh, someone presenting at a diabetic presenting with ketone bodies think about it even with normal sugars and give dextrose and insulin you'll see magically the acidosis gets better and they recover very fast so the conclusions for edka my friends is because of increase in the use of sglt2 inhibitors always have an index of suspicion that there is increase in the occurrence rate of edka patients that are coming to icu so be aware of that Always important to ponder on the drug history. If they are taking uh, dapagliflozone or empagliflozone, so on and so forth, SGLT2, think of EDCA. And symptoms of, the, if any patients come with symptoms of DKA with normal glycemia, always think that there is possibly an EDCA that is, uh, that is prevailing and you have to treat with dextrose and insulin with fluid optimization and correction of electrolytes. That remains the T-nets and that will remarkably get the patients better. So that's about it, folks, on EDCA. So this is a nice topic. It could be asked as a question. And even from the clinical standpoint, you don't know about this, then you don't treat it effectively and patients don't get better. So you can create magical results by at least understanding this conceptually. So thank you, friends. Request you all to submit your valuable work to Journal of Acute Care. Of course, you can visit my website to react to this lecture. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. So it's a nice quote. The best portion of a good man's life is this little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and love. Thank you. Thank you, friends.